to everyone in the chat. I guess that's, uh, I guess we're roughly at five o'clock, five o'clock UK, I guess at nine o'clock San Francisco, six o'clock for Nick. Uh, so uh, so we'll get started. So welcome to the to our latest episode of the Neo4j uh, online meetup. If you haven't joined us before, uh, when uh, Nick is presenting any code or any slides, uh, if, you, if the display looks a bit blurry, you have controls in the bottom right-hand corner of the YouTube window where you can set the resolution. Uh, sometimes YouTube doesn't pick the right one. 720p uh, will be enough. If the code isn't big enough, just shout on the chat, and uh, I'll see it. Uh, we can sort that out. Uh, otherwise, any questions, uh, write them in the, the YouTube chat, and I will collect them up and field them to, to Nick. Uh, so uh, uh, with that, uh, welcome, uh, welcome Nick. So Nick's going to be talking with us about a project called Open the Box uh, that he's been uh, working on. So he's doing, taking a exploring uh, corporate networks in Belgium. So, so with that, I'll, uh, I'll hand over to you, Nick. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to talk around this online meetup. It's, it's uh, a bit funny um, talking to my screen. <laughs> I'm just going to pretend there is an, a very enthusiastic audience uh, just in front of me and uh, things will probably go smooth. OK, let me uh, share my screen. Uh, there we go. Um, you should see the, the presentation right now. Mark, can, can you see it? Yeah, we're good. OK, perfect. So um, uh, in this uh, um, uh, meetup, I'm going to talk about um, a project that I have been building uh, uh, quite recently, uh, openthebox.be. Uh, uh, and it's, it's uh, able to show all the different uh, connections that exist between companies and, and uh, the administrators of the company. And even recently, uh, I have also added the, the the mandates of the politicians, which is, which is currently a quite an, uh, a lively topic, I would say, in uh, in Belgium. Um, so let's maybe start start at, at the beginning. So where does all of this uh, come from? How did I came to the idea to to build all this? And um, basically, I have been working on um, like company databases in the past, where I actually ran. Um, uh, used unstructured uh, data, com uh, information from websites, to be able to find out what uh, what exactly the the companies were were uh, specialized in. And when I um, ended that project, um, I started an, a new job um, with uh, with the three weeks of, of uh, spare time. So I re I decided to to use that three weeks to to see if I could build an, a system from um, a similar like a company database but not using unstructured database but using structured database there's a lot of, of uh, data available right now huh, with uh, like the open data um, community open knowledge community that's uh, constantly pushing uh, governments and other organizations to to open up their, their data and the, the the real spark in fact was one of um, uh, Rick van Bruggen tweets or maybe in English Rick van van Bruggen <laughs> If you know that better, it's um, always Rick's fault, isn't it? Uh, 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 let's say it's Rick's fault. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, he um, took um, an article from a financial magazine and um, that that showed connections between uh, public uh, companies, uh, about a hundred companies, and he he put put it into Neo4j. So you can see this here on on, on the left. And in fact, that was for me the spark to say, well, let, let's see if I can uh, scale that up a bit and use all of the Belgian companies, uh, about uh, like 500,000 companies, uh, and um, take all of, all of the connections that, that are available in the public data and actually make an, a system out of it, a system that, that I mean, put it online that, that people can, can use it for whatever needs they, they have. And so that it's it's twofold. So the at the right side you can see this uh, the the fun to to be able to convert an ID into a real system. The ID itself is is interesting, but actually building it and, and putting it online is is uh, is also very fun. So that's the the two uh, like sparks that that put me onto that uh, project. In fact, it's it's quite limited in scope. So I, I worked on it uh, full time and probably even more uh, for these uh, three weeks. Uh, and I could basically uh, create like the the big platform on on, on this period of time. So it's really a, a small project in, in terms of the time I spent. 
and then uh, that was in uh, in May. So the the next couple of months, uh, I, I just added some some more features uh, to it uh, to to actually put it in, in into production, uh, which happened uh, last week. Uh, I sent out a tweet uh, on Sunday, and uh, there was a huge response, lots of uh, retweets, and people started to visiting uh, visit the site. So uh, yeah, it was fun to uh, to follow that. So quick quick question for me. So lots of people often ask, how long does it take to build? Uh, graph or near 4 j backed project. So that had you d ever done any near 4 j stuff before? Is this your first time touching it, or I did some uh, some some spikes in the past. I remember a Go application where I loaded uh, all of my emails and the uh, the replies and the the forwards. Uh, that was a fun project. It's a couple of years ago, so I have some experience, okay. but I'm definitely not an expert. Um, and I, I think that's probably the, like, the maybe the takeaway that I hope to bring to to the audience that yeah. um, it, there is no need to be a deep expert in in any of all these bu building blocks uh, to, uh, to to deliver something from ID to production. The the main difficulty, as uh, as far as I can see it, is in the gluing together all of these components to 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 build something uh, valuable. So uh, yeah, Neo4j. I'm, I'm using a lot of other technologies. We will go to, uh, into it later on, but uh, I'm not an expert on each one of them. So if there is any Neo4j specific questions, Mark, I'm happy for you to uh, to forward you that question. <laughs> Lucky me. Cool. <laughs> so yeah, maybe a little bit more about myself. So I'm uh, I'm a developer. Uh, have spent um, different roles, mostly te technical. Um, I ended up at, at one point also in the, the DevOps uh, community, uh, DevOps for the, the, the big enterprises where I was working there. So there, there again, uh, so you see my interest in um, uh, moving away from the, 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 the specialized silos and bringing all the, the people closer together uh, in order to speed up the, the releases, basically. So yeah, you can see the, the same pattern appearing in, in, in many of my uh, uh, my projects, my, my journeys. Um, so recently, I moved a couple of years ago to uh, data engineering and, and data science, and that's what I'm currently uh, doing. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, I have I, I would say I have a lot of experience in all kinds of different things, uh, but never being the, the the pure specialist. So okay, let's move to the to the actual uh, project. So. Uh, I talked already about open data. So what exactly am I going to, to use as open data? And how, how am I going to put that into Neo4j and show that to, to the end users? That's, that's the, like the, the big picture uh, flow that we're going to, uh, to go through during this uh, session. So um, initially, I had two um, like data sets, feeds. Uh, one is from uh, KBO, so the, the organization I can, I can show it here. Um, let's see, right here. So it's an organization that keeps track of the, the VAT numbers, and you can search uh, like uh, by, by VAT number, by name, and it shows like um, for the company uh, TOFS. So um, I'm going to use that as an example throughout the, the session. So TOFS is very known in Belgium, Schoenen TOFS, so they, they sell shoes. Uh, it's a, a very successful company. Uh, they have received lots of prizes as the best company and the best employer. So everybody in Belgium knows them. I'm not sure if for this audience, but it doesn't really matter that much. Can you zoom but, that one in a little bit so we can see ah, yeah, what, so. what what sort of data we're, we're playing? Probably a little bit more. Yeah, that's probably pretty good. Okay, so it's so sort this of is pretty much like static data, like the the legal name, the the, the address. Uh, um, the locations and so on. Uh, the VAT number, that's really the identifier. That, that's where everything uh, starts. And that's available as a data set uh, online. So you can just uh, download it and, and, and play with it. So this is um, interesting on itself. Right? You can uh, already make connections uh, from like based on locations and so on. But it's not enough. Right? We need more. So there is also. Um, the information from the, I don't know in English, I think the, the National Bank, uh, it uh, contains all the, the annual accounts of uh, the, those companies who have to uh, publish these accounts, uh, uh, like, like make them available uh, to, to the public. 
Uh, there, are, there is a couple of company types who don't need it, and some of them do need it. Uh, I don't want to go in that direction, but from the one million companies, more or less, in Belgium, there is about half of them who, who need to have a public uh, annual account. So these accounts, they contain interesting information. Um, for e like each year, they, they show the, the, the figures, like uh, uh, yeah, the, the names in English, but uh, how much money the, the company has brought in, the, the gain, the, the profit, uh, uh, the, the money they have in the bank account, the, the debts, and so on. Um, but they also contain the, um, the administrators of that company. Uh, so that, that's people. Huh? There's the, like the, the names of the people, their addresses. And that's where it gets interesting. That's uh, in terms of Neo4g, you could say, ah, this, this is a connection between the node company and the node uh, person. Um, so it, um, there is also participations that's um, contained in, in the file between uh, companies. And so if company A uh, owns parts of, of company B, that's also mentioned. Um, but it's not mentioned if that's a person who owns parts of a company. That's private information. So that, that's all we have. Uh, in that data set. I so think we, we have something similar uh, called Companies House in the UK that sounds like it has some of the uh, the similar data as what you have there. But I don't I don't know I don't know that they make it as easy to uh, to access it. So that there's a, there's tend to be some other services where people almost make that data easier to to process. So there's one called uh, Open Corporates, but that's like a commercial uh, data. Yes, I know it. Yeah, it's it's very similar. So. Um, uh, there's lots of companies uh, the, who, who make that information available. It's quite a mature market. I think it, it exists uh, for, for a long time. And okay. everything starts with uh, yeah, having the, the annual accounts available. Uh, yeah. All the rest is uh, and information that is added from, from other uh, sources, but this is really the, the core. So here you can see the, um, like the, the website of uh, the National Bank. So again, I looked up uh, the same company, Tofs, and you can see for all of the previous years, I don't know how, how many years it exists, but maybe 30 years or whatever. And you can both see the, the, the annual account. Let's, let's maybe do that uh, right here. Oops. Can't find it right now. Let's go back. Ah, yeah, the site itself. <laughs> Let, let's look it up again. That's why we need to open the box. Yeah, 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 here we go. <laughs> yeah, so it, it's not that easy to, to find it because there is a lot of posts and I had to put in the, the postcode. There we go, POFs L. Voilà. Voilà, there we go, and then I can uh, show the annual account. Yeah, there we go. And that's exactly what, what I'm using. Can you, can you yep. see it enough? So this is, this is like their annual report, is it? So interesting information is, is all of this. Huh? So the, the, oh, the wow. persons or the companies, can, they're, they're, it's possible that the company is an administrator of another company, and then it's represented by a person. So all of this information, you have it. And also, if you scroll down the, the numbers, uh, well, th this is in Dutch, but yeah, I think it's similar in English. And then participation somewhere, it's also. So uh, let's not go into that much of detail. Um, but anyway, you, you get a grasp of uh, what's available. and. More interestingly, it's also available as an, some kind of an XML file with uh, a specific schema. It's called XBRL. It's quite known in financial and accountancy uh, uh, sectors. Um, but it's something that's easily accessible by computers. And that's exactly what I have uh, used here. So the PDF is not really that useful. So the XML and the PDF are all the same information, yeah, right? Yeah, it's just cool. two different formats of the same information. Cool. That's good. You didn't have to do some PDF scraping. That wouldn't have been so fun. No, no, not in this case. But wait, but we have a third wow. one, third feed. That's the um, the political manager. So the first two feeds are uh, economic. Yeah? So I started with with these two feeds. Um, it gave already an, a, a complete view of the like the like the economic. Uh, um, corporate uh, network in Belgium, but I thought that it would be more interesting to add one more dimension, the political dimension. So in Belgium, and I don't know in, in the UK or anywhere else, but in Belgium, the, the, um, the politicians have to declare the, the mandates that they have in, in, in companies or in, 
uh, in other organizations. So that's an, a PDF, huh, like you, you said, uh, that's uh, published once a year in the Belgian official gazette. It's Belgisch Staatsblad in, in Dutch. And there is about 7,000 politicians and 50,000 mandates that you can see uh, on the right here. Um, uh, yeah, ex explaining what, what these mandates are. So there I had to reprocess the PDF, um, put that into uh, yeah, a more easily accessible format, and then integrate that also with the existing uh, data that I already had. So let's see. Yeah, just before going uh, to the application itself, let's just have a look at the schema. I think that's important as well for uh, people uh, interested in Neo4j. How are we going to to to, um, to structure all of that information to get something out of it. So the core piece, I don't have my, my mouse here. Yeah. So the core piece is uh, definitely the, the company. So everything starts with the company. And then you can find, like I said, the the persons administering it um, on the, the, the orange block. And then just below, there is this a triple, the, the person represents a company that administers a company, another company, the main company. Uh, there is also the participations, uh, the, the, the red uh, arrows, and then the politicians are also added, uh, like uh, linked to, to the company. So all these arrows um, become uh, relationships in, in Neo4j, uh, Neo4j in a moment. But presumably, you could end up having someone who's a person that is a politician. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, this yeah. is uh, it, cool. it's basically just a, a person that I have um, modeled, but uh, mm -hmm. a person can be also a politician if he has a political mandate. And so, right. this is just to make it easier to understand, but th this purple uh, node doesn't exist, there's no type for it. Uh, yeah. Okay, cool. So, demonstration let's see uh, what, what it gives once the, the system is. Uh, is actually running, so um, yeah. So this is the website that anybody can access, right? So I've, yeah. So uh, if you open the box, yeah, uh, put the link on the on the chat. Ah, oh, yeah. Go ahead. Anyway, cool. Yeah. So there is uh, three main uh, use cases: a company search, where you start from one company that 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 you would search for, and then you want to go out. A person search, and then connections, which is basically you have two nodes, a person or a company, and another person or a company, and you say, well, how are they connected? Give me the, the shortest path in terms of uh, like graph uh, theory. What's the shortest path between these uh, these two, if, if it exists? Um, yeah, I guess uh, we have, don't have to go through all of these things. I will just uh, show everything through a demo. So let's go into search for, ah, this is uh, someone else. Um, Let's look for Oops. So initially, you can see, well, it, it shows a lot of uh, people uh, and also companies. But the, the one that I, we were looking for, it's, it's Stoffs L. For some reason, there is an L behind it. So uh, we can find it here. And immediately, uh, it will show you the, the direct connections, um, exactly those connections that you can find in, in, the, in the annual account itself. Uh, so these are. Companies, the, the green arrows again are the other companies administering uh, this company and uh, the representatives as well. So the representatives are um, uh, modeled as being also an administrator of the, the company that's administrating this one. And that there is also another a direct connection where you can see, for example, this uh, through which company it's uh, doing this. So you have all the, the information. Uh, the participations as well. So these companies apparently have an, a circular dependency, an administration, and a participation. And there is no political people involved in this company. So from here, uh, you can see it's, it's quite uh, fast so that Neo4j was, was able to come up with this query. It's, it's also a very simple one. But we can expand it. Huh? We can go from the, the most direct connections to one, one hop out. Huh? That would be two hops. So we just click Expand Web. And you can also see, hop, immediately it will show you um, the extended information. So the, the network starts to grow. Um, you can also show location information. That's not something I've mentioned so far. But uh, if 
for example, two companies are located on the same address, even if they have no other relationship, um, they are still connected and there is something between them. So that can also be shown, uh, like in this case, uh, for example, uh, um, Torf's import service is located on the same location as Torf's L. But it could be that it, it has no other links than just this location and then it would be added to the to the graph where it wouldn't have been added without uh, the location information. So yeah, you can see we can expand it a lot. I'm going to, to oh, squeeze well, the well. limits, <laughs> see how far it goes. So is this your, is this your own visualization uh, library or? No, no, that's, uh, it's very complex to build a, like a layout okay. that optimizes uh, these, uh, these graphs. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm using a library. I will, I will talk to it about okay, it, cool. uh, on, uh, later on. Yeah. People, people uh, love the, the graph visualization. Yeah. I thought that a better, better check. Yeah, yeah, but I have a lot to say cool. about it. Great. Um, let's see what more we can show you. So I can also show the direct connections in, in tabular form, so it shows more details. But that's, that's not really that much Neo4j specific. Uh, uh, I think this is really the, the core of why I, I, I use uh, Neo4j. You can see it's it's extremely fast. Huh? The, even with, uh, I don't know how many, four or five hops, it, it still takes a fraction of, of uh, a second for Neo4j. It takes even longer, in fact, for the the the, um, the library, the J the JavaScript library, to build the graph than than it takes to uh, to t to to get it out of Neo4j. So, yeah, you have to make sure that none of the the used building blocks become uh, bottlenecks. Uh. And then the second feature hmm, is the the connections uh, between two nodes. Uh, so here I can uh, immediately start. I can say, well, I want to start from Torps, and I want to connect it to another personal company. Um, yeah, I don't know exactly which one, but uh, let's say Mark Kuke is also a very known uh, business person. Ah, yeah, so you see, you can see here there is no direct connection, but there is a or, or uh, well there isn't an an an, uh, an edge shown, but through the the location information there is still a, a connection and so usually you would you would see all arrows between them but uh, in fact this is the connection the, the uh, location connection is is not shown as an edge but it's shown as as the the, the boundary color in fact um, and here as well you can expand uh, you can say this this in fact in terms of the graph um, uh, algorithms this is is using the the shortest path and so first of all it's going to to look for the shortest path, how, how many nodes or how many hops are there in the shortest path, and then it's going to find all of the shortest paths uh, with or all of the paths with that many uh, hops. And so it could be a lot of um, connections from from the the default uh, view. And then uh, from the shortest path, we can expand. We can say, well, also give me the the paths with with one one more hop. Maybe the minimum was five. Now I also want to show the the, those with six hops, and so you get can get more interesting information. So we still have that company here, the red the box, or no, here it was, I think, yeah, Torres. And then you can see how it connects to uh, Mark Kuke at the end. So I would say this is quite far. So maybe they just don't know each other. Um, there is a lot of companies in between them, so I, 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 there's probably not really an interesting link between them. But you you see the approach. This is um, a feature that would not be possible without using a, a graph database, uh, I'm, I'm quite sure. Mark, what, what do you think? I don't think a relational database would ever be possible, like, would capable to, to show uh, like the shortest path between two Yeah, persons. I think it's a, uh, you normally have to give a bit of structure to your queries, don't you, in SQL, whereas yeah. here you're just saying, hey, here's, a, here's a, like a row or a record, here's another one. You figure out how they're connected. I think that that type of if you have that type of structure in your data. It works really nicely with graphs. Yeah, yeah, it's really faster. It didn't really take that much time to build the query. It's mostly like out of the box uh, uh, cipher or APOC uh, features that I'm using. So yeah, very happy to to use that. Cool. 
Okay, um, that's about it. Is there any questions? Is there people who want to see uh, other things or it's not clear? Uh, there's not at the moment. There's just no. been okay. uh, perfect. So I guess we can carry, we can carry on. But yeah, if the questions come up, ask. Carry on. Yeah. There was just um, uh, Adrian pointed out Companies House as an API where you can get the similar uh, offices data as you uh, were showing uh, before. Yeah, exactly. Nice so yeah, I think there's there's a lot of uh, companies who are in that uh, domain of uh, like uh, company search, right? So that it's mm -hmm. it's a mature market. But um, well, gradually, uh, newer technologies are being made available. I'm thinking of Neo4j, but there is a lot more, like uh, and using Spark as well. And uh, it becomes really easy to to process uh, huge data sets, to integrate them, to uh, to uh, make connections between them, and to to show them. Like I said, I'm not an expert in all of this, and I still I'm able to to do quite funny and interesting uh, things with it. So the question has come up uh, already uh, in the past. Like, yeah, why did I start with this? Uh, so I, I already mentioned the two sparks, but in, in in the end, it's all about like the fun of being able to 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 build something and being creative. And um, yeah, in fact, I have never built an an, an an online system that's available for the 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 public. And most of the time, it's it's an internal tool of of or it's available for the public, but really uh, with with very uh, like a, sp a specific target audience you don't have that much uh, users but this is really yeah you put it online and you don't know is there many people or a few people who will use it uh, you have to build a system that's capable of, of handling different uh, ways of using it uh, different loads so very interesting the second reason is also to well improve the world i, I called it like this so it's like my little contribution to uh, to the world. I think, uh, especially in these times, it's important to uh, to look at the democracy and s uh, protect it and see how how we can help the democracy. And I think transparency is is one of the 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 big building blocks of uh, democracy. So hopefully, my tool can can just uh, add a little value in in that area as well. And third, it's also like commercially it, it was not directly um, uh, I how would I say uh, the, the reason was not uh, commercial directly but I'm sure what I this is this is a nice business card uh, for myself I can also always refer to this site and I get uh, interested uh, interesting connections I'm able to speak at the neo4j meetup and so on so that's uh, yeah the three main reasons so let's move on to the more technical side, um, dig a bit deeper into the system. I think that's uh, what most people are interested in. Mm. in the... We have a couple of questions about yeah. the visualization, but I guess let's wait until you get to that bit and yeah. we can do them you can, you can see it right here. So I'm just uh, going through the the whole process. So the, um, the three imports, we already mentioned them before. Uh, the three data sets, and they are going to be um, integrated in um, on uh, Spark and, and Scala. So that's the, the tools that I'm used to, to work with. I built uh, also my own lightweight framework. It's also uh, open source uh, available uh, to be able to, to quickly like create an, a workflow of different uh, jobs that you can process and uh, integrate. Um, I don't think we have to go into that in, in too much details. This is not a, a Spark uh, session, so... Um, just assume that in the end the the data is integrated and so we have the the companies and you have the persons and you have the, the like the, the relationships uh, basically um, I had to make a decision uh, at at one point on how to uh, import the integrated data into neo four j so initially I was thinking uh, because I'm using the latest versions of uh, of spark and there is a data frame that's easy to be used and there is some integration capabilities uh, into neo4j but I found out it was quite recent so I didn't uh, go in that direction yet because I, I was not sure if the, the performance would be okay or if I would have to spend too much time troubleshooting so I took the I would say the the traditional or the the previous generation approach maybe uh, to go through csv um, that has been um has had some pros but also some some cons so the the pro 
has definitely been the uh, the, the 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 ease of of getting getting it uh, uh, of, of being able to use it. And so you have you just have to export your data as CSV, and then you create a cipher script that's able to to um, um, like use that CSV and load that into Neo4j. That was quite quickly to uh, to build. The performance was actually great as well. I had uh, fear because CSV uh, and, and that script would take hours of time, but that was not the case. I think the the, the biggest um, or the whole thing. I think it's it only takes about fifteen minutes on an, an a moderate uh, hardware. The only thing that was quite difficult was the uh, the lack of of uh, data types. Maybe I'm I'm doing things wrong as well, but like having uh, the the possibility to create um, uh, struct arrays of of structs like arrays of um, how do you call it uh, user defined types in uh, and and add that to a node that was not possible and so basically you really have to 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 normalize the CSVs to to one level you cannot add or not easily add hierarchies let's say you have a person and you have a list of addresses um, you would have you would need to have an, a separate CSV with the list of addresses and then merge that into the the person, I guess. So that was a little bit uh, troublesome. And also the additional hop. Huh? So uh, each uh, step that you take, huh, um, it it requires uh, a schema to, to be defined somewhere, implicitly or explicitly. But let's say you want to add a field. Um, you have to, to add it on each and every step that you take. So if I would have the chance to, to connect my Spark workflow directly to Neo4j, at least it would be one, one less uh, hop to, to take. But anyway, I mean, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, it's not that I'm working on that constantly. So it, it was just fine uh, to spend, uh, like to, make, to get it to work and then focus on more important things. Um, in the right. end. Yeah, We've got sure. a couple of questions for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of, uh, from Zach is asking, how, how big was the, the CSV or the CSV files that you were working with? Um, good question. I, I don't know by heart. Uh, I know the, the, the Neo4j database is about the two uh, gigabyte. OK. Uh, yeah, so I don't remember the CSV. It's, it, it's not that big. The, yeah. Most of the information is uh, is already removed through all of the integration steps. So, um, what's yeah? It's and about then the sec second question is: a person's name is not necessarily unique. How do you prevent joining together two people with the same name? Ah, yes, that's that's an interesting uh, uh, question, an, an interesting uh, challenge. Mm -hmm. um, because the companies, that's easy. We have the VAT number, so they have an an identifier, a yeah. unique identifier. The the persons, they're just like additional information. Uh, and I've noticed in the annual accounts, um, sometimes I know that uh, um, like the same person is managing two companies, but then you look in the annual account and then you see that he has a, a different address or maybe the same address, but with a typo. It's people who have manually input that. There is no check if the address exists or it's, if it's uh, uh, like uh, there's no typos in it. Uh, there's French, Dutch uh, ways of, of writing. Lots of like uh, issues there. But most of the um, the problems I have been able to solve. So there is uh, still some duplicate people in it. Uh, I guess with machine learning, I, I would be able to squeeze the the ninety percent to maybe ninety five percent. But in the end, yeah, sometimes as a person, also you 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 cannot distinguish if if it's the same person or or if it's a different one, if he is registered on two different addresses, personally, I would I wouldn't be able to know uh, if if that would be the same person. So the approach that I have taken is that I will only um, merge two two instances of a person together if it obviously it has the same name, but if if it also has another property like the same street or or a postcode or uh, the same VAT number that that he is part of. And then I will merge it, because um, if I merge, if I falsely merge two persons into one, that's a big problem. Huh? My, my system is is dead wrong. But if 
one person still exists as two instances in my system, you will probably still find it. You will search for the name and then you will see the, twice the name come up and then you can still look at the, the two uh, like graphs uh, next to each other. Yeah, so that cool. was my response. Yep. Hopefully, hopefully that, that question's answered. I remember doing that on one of my first Neo4j uh, uh, problems I was playing around with. I was working for a consulting company building a database of the people and the projects they worked on and the name as the uh, as the key and ended up there were two Mike Jones or three Mike Jones and they were somehow like working on three projects at the same time. It's like, oh, <laughs> this person's yeah. very productive. Uh, or oh, I've just messed up the, uh, the name. We've got another question actually in the time that you've answered that one. Um, sure, yeah. Um, what uh, I think this is about the lightweight for like so the question says what additional features is your lightweight framework adding that Neo4j doesn't already have so I think this is actually referring maybe to your uh, lightweight framework that you've got on top of the Scala and Spark yes exactly so this is purely a Scala a uh, uh, Spark uh, framework so there is no Neo4j uh, functionality in it uh, okay. like like uh, like the question. Assumes I, I haven't had the need yet to uh, to build my own Neo4j framework. So uh, yeah, cool. Um, so this the CSV export is then is done through a, a Bash and and Cipher scripts. Huh? So that's that's also added into that uh, that big workflow from uh, starting from the the beginning. So it, it's one workflow that actually does everything. So I just run a script and everything gets processed until. Like the, the Neo4j database is available, so that's uh, that's the end of the the backend process. This is running on uh, on uh, on Amazon on AWS. So this is a uh, relatively big machine. I think it's either six, sixteen or thirty two, depending on what exactly I'm going to need. It's a bit more expensive, but I only use it maybe one hour to, to do to do a whole uh, process, and then it's finished. I throw it away and uh, I just pay for the one hour. And the Neo4j database is the only like deliverable that I need. That's then, well, uh, it's taken from like an, uh, let's say, an, a web server, like an, an, a small um, Amazon uh, instance uh, that's uh, downloaded from there uh, onto its the local file system. There it uh, runs play, so it's also a, a, a Scala, uh, Based the web server play, um, and uh, the front end, the, the JavaScript uh, platform is using Cytoscape.js. So there was a question about uh, the, the the library I'm using to to visualize the graph. So that's that's the one who is going to to visualize it. Is now a good time to fit to to do the the um, visualization questions? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Cool. Uh, there are three. Um, I guess I'll do all of them in one go, and then you can. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so first one, what about are there uh, various layouts of the data instead of having randomized layout of nodes information in a circle? So I guess the question is, is can you do different layouts? Uh, mm -hmm. Second question, uh, could you easily use D3 libraries for rendering on the fly for different visualizations? And then uh, the last question is, how extensive is the data layout nodes categories relationships used? So, so the third one is how extensive is uh, is the data layout? So I think it's a, sort of similar to the first question. It's my interpretation. Ah yeah. Okay. So let's start with the first two. So yes, Cytoscape. Um, maybe we can uh, look it up. That's the, the link. We'll have to zoom this page in a bit when it loads ah. up. Yeah, so I, I I used D3 before. I think maybe we can we can uh, combine the two questions. So I used D3 before to visualize uh, graphs, but it was uh, yeah, a huge work. It, it it felt like a couple of uh, layers of abstractions uh, that were that were missing. So you really have to mm -hmm. dig in deep, and you have to make sure that the the zooming works and uh, all the like the cross cutting concerns. You you have to to build them yourself. So you can do everything with it, but it's uh, it takes a long time. And 
for me, site escape was an, an easier option. So in this project, I, I decided to to try it out, and in fact, I haven't uh, looked back to, at uh, D three uh, second anymore um, because it. it Really sits on, on the graph level, so it's focused on showing graphs. Well, D three you can yeah, you can do everything with it, um, and uh, to to respond to the question, so the layouts you have different uh, layouts. I think it's you can see here, for example, the cola layout and the circle layout and concentric layout, grid layout, and so on. And I picked one of them, the cozy layout. So this this is the one I picked. There's also cozy bilkent layout, which is similar, but it was too slow for me, so I, I stick, stuck to, to this one. Um, but indeed, yeah, I, I could choose a different layout, like Dagri layout, that would be more an, a hierarchic layout. Uh, I played with that as well, but um, then you would see the company at the top, and then each level would be like going going down. But this is really like, yeah, the, the structure of the graphs for me fit was, was a better fit the, to use the, the cozy layout. It's just uh, force directed, so it takes into account like the the gravity between uh, the, the nodes and the, the repulsion, and then based on these constraints, it it will find an, an optimal solution. And it's not always the same. Like if you uh, let's go back, maybe let's just you run it initially. So if I if I run it again, it's a it, it's a different, uh, slightly different layout. So. Um, ah, here it's yeah, so you can see it's a little bit different. So each time, uh, it 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 will find a different uh, optimum. So that is that did this response answer the three questions? Or? Uh, I guess we'll go. I think we're a little bit delayed, so I guess we can wait. But ah. but, but yeah, so you could. So do you generally could you choose a different one? Like if you got back like loads of data, or if like if, if people were, like if they, could you get it to do a different yeah. layout when they clicked on the more uh, version versus when they, they do the fewer nodes if you wanted to? Yes, in fact, I tried that out. Initially, I was oh, cool. using this okay. cozy bilkent, and uh, I noticed that um, it was too slow at, uh, like, like once you have three or four uh, hops, it's, it's okay. become slow. Like, Took ten seconds or even longer. It it, it uh, blocked the whole uh, browser, and then I switched back to the the cozy, which is less qualitative but faster. Yeah. And I, I thought maybe I should start with this one initially and then gradually switch to the other one when when it gets bigger. But the question is, yeah, when when do you do this? Huh? Because you don't know in advance uh, how many nodes or how complex the graph will be in the next hop. It could be a very simple yeah. one with two hops, and then the third node would be Im uh, immensely complex. So I just decided let's just start with, uh, uh, let's just use the cozy initially and, and keep it all the way. But it would be de de okay. definitely possible to, to make it configurable, that let, maybe let the user choose or um, put an, an in intelligent algorithm that could switch one or the other. Uh, I tried different things, but yeah, I don't want to make it too complex as well, the, the website. So um, it, it should be useful for non-tech people as well. So I think this is the 80% the or maybe the 95% yeah. uh, use case. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, I think the vi visualization stuff gets very fiddly, doesn't it, once, you, once you're trying to start perfecting it for every single case. Yeah, yeah, there's no perfect way. I mean, like this one as well, you could say, yeah, but this should actually be here. Why does it have an overlap? But it, it's because the, yeah. the algorithm doesn't take into account yet the the like the crossing of edges. That would like be maybe That's, a next version. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose that adds in a bit of bit more computation, doesn't it? If it's going to yeah, be yeah, it's uh, it's hmm. very advanced stuff that's behind simply showing like these these nodes. Uh, as a human, you can easily lay that out, but an algorithm is uh, is not uh, that easy. Yeah. So I'm happy that other people make these libraries and they share them for free, and then I can just use them. And, uh, so, would you, if, for anyone who's gonna who wants to put some sort of visualization into an application they're building, would you would you would you would site escape have your would that be your recommended one to start with? Yeah, sure, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, so D3, I think that's yeah. yeah, I think people I've seen people use D3 and then uh, Sigma JS, another one. Um, but yeah, I. Yeah. I've not really, I've not really used any of them in as much depth as you have. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm sure that like there's a lot of there, there's the desktop versions as well of uh, graph visualizations. I'm not an expert in this, but yeah, I think there's lots of options depending on on the use case. So I I went with Cytoscape and yeah, that's cool. fine for now. So yeah, in the end, so we have this um, uh, the web server, and that's actually going to become an an image. So I'm I'm going to create an, an Amazon image from this one, and then I can spin up. Uh, uh, instances at, at at will later on, but that this is actually the yeah. whole uh, the whole flow. Um, now that we're talking about like more the, the ops uh, stuff, so I think it, it's really fun uh, to to be creative and build an application. But if you decide to make it an, a system and and put it online, there's a, a lot more involved into this. And the development part is only a small uh, a small step. Um, as a developer, we we typically work in this uh, this laboratory uh, with uh, very uh, uh, clean uh, assumptions and so on. But in the end, whatever comes out of this will have to run in in production in reality uh, in in an environment where you don't know how many people you will have, you don't know what they will be doing uh, uh, concurrently. You, you're not sure of the hardware. Right? Sometimes uh, one or more components break down and need to be fixed. So all of this, um, you need to take that into account from the, the first uh, line of code that you write, basically. So make sure, even with uh, the simple application that I have, uh, I made sure to, to make a uh, connection to the Neo4j database uh, that's Resilient, huh? so if if Neo4j is is gone for a moment, uh, it it should try again huh? regularly, and once Neo4j may come up again, it, it should be able to to start working again. Uh, I actually had that problem; that was the only problem I had when I uh, had all the people connecting to the site. Like at one point, like um, at at twelve o'clock at night, boom, the the Neo4j database. Uh, Crashed for some reason. I have no idea why. Maybe it was some some script that run because it was straight twelve o'clock. But after two minutes, it was back up because the the way it was deployed and the application connected again to it and, and things went went fine. Um, and even the like there is only one more connection from my code uh, to um, to the logging uh, infrastructure that's using a uh, pweek. It's uh, actually an, an an HTTP call. And even there, I. I remember I thought, well, should I put that in a, in a separate thread or should I just leave it uh, like this? And I decided to put it in a separate thread. And that's the other thing I, I'm, I noticed that at one point the, the logging framework was, was uh, or the logging service was uh, not available. So it started to, uh, to disconnect, uh, to, um, to time out. And I'm happy that I, I was able to, uh, to use a separate thread and not have an impact on the, the normal flow. So that's really important. Um, the circuit breakers as well. Um, so taking into account the, the timeouts, um, that was probably one, one interesting uh, feature that I have added, and I wanted to, to show that in, in code as well. So the, um, so this is the, the Scala play application. So get neighborhood JSON, that's the, the query that actually uh, takes the 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 nodes and the edges and the, the, the input for the cytoscape, that's actually what, what's coming out of this one. And you can see that I'm using the run time boxed because it's, it's very difficult uh, to, to know in advance uh, um, how long uh, a query will take. And like I, I just explained in a moment, sometimes with two hops, it's, it's fine. There's only 10 uh, nodes, but with three hops, it may be 1,000 or 10,000 nodes. Um, so Basically, you can't know in advance. And so I need a way to say, well, if this query is going to take too long uh, and it's going to block all of the other um, processes, I want, to, I want it to end. So using this, uh, this APOC uh, query, is, was, uh, this APOC um, function was, was exactly what I needed. So I, I specify run time box. <clears throat> I specify two seconds. And now I'm 100% sure that no um, calls will take longer than two seconds. If it takes longer than, than the timeout is hit, and the, the user, well, the user is impacted, of course. The user will get a message saying, like, uh, we were not able at this point to, uh, to respond to your, your query. 
either you can try again on, on a moment that's uh, where, where there's less people uh, connecting to the site or it's just uh, too complex we will never be able to to return this in, in two seconds and well that's that's the constraint that I have to uh, to live with otherwise uh, like you can see maybe once while we're here I'm, I'm going to uh, look for a part with uh, a configurable number of hops and once I have this part I'm, I'm taking all of the nodes out of this and I'm going to look for all the the edges between these nodes so I'm not only taking the the edges that were part of the the parts but also the indirect edges and that that's added a lot more information to the uh, to, to the graph um, that's maybe difficult to explain but uh, this this provides a more of a complete picture to do it like it. so yeah it was also something interested I wanted to uh, to mention um, otherwise in terms of scalability, uh, like I said, I, I have I had no clue if there is there would be a lot of people or just a few people connecting to it. Uh, it may end up somewhere in a newspaper and thousands of people connect to it. So I decided to take scalability seriously, uh, to put it behind the a load balancer uh, and also use an auto scaling group. So the image that I talked about earlier that that is uh, built at, uh, during deploy time. In fact, it's it's a read-only system, so it's very uh, easy to to scale out uh, because each each instance that I create is completely autonomous. It has all the the data. It doesn't need to connect to another instance to to update a field or whatever. It can just live autonomously. So that's a big uh, it makes it a lot easier. And right now, if uh, if I if there, if the load is is high, huh, um, there will just be automatically a new instance uh, created. Uh, so, I I made the site public uh, last uh, Sunday. I just sent out a tweet, and there was uh, quite some response on it. So I had uh, thousands of of people uh, connecting to it uh, since then, and it was really interesting to see like how how, how does this the the system react because. Before then, it's just theory, and you can theorize as much as you want. But you, when when they actually connect, then you will see if if it works. And I was really amazed how how little CPU uh, was was needed by these uh, these instances. Uh, it, it didn't really uh, like, it didn't show anything. The CPU was very low all the time. So uh, on a small server, that that I think that was amazing. It's ready for for more. I would say. Um, it's ready to be featured in the paper. <laughs> yes, <yeah. laughs> we could say. Yeah, between thousands and then ten thousand and hundred thousand. Yeah, it, it's still well in the air. We'll, we'll see if, if it ever gets that far. But uh, it, it's it would be an interesting adventure to see how how it would work. And then um, moving even further than dev and ops, and there is a lot more even to take into account the. The, the the UI. I'm definitely not uh, an, an an expert in on that side, so I asked someone else to uh, to cover that and so to build a nice uh, user interface on top of it. I think it's yeah, it's it it it's look nice. It looks nice for me. I think there's definitely some some more work to do, but it's uh, presentable. Uh, but yeah, it took time uh, to find someone and to coordinate and, and that stuff. Uh, once uh, you're more than one person, <laughs> things become a lot more complex. Then the infrastructure and AWS you have to, uh, to 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 get to know it. Uh, there's a lot of uh, features um, available there, so you have to know which feature to use and which not. So it's also a whole experience. And logging, I use Pivik. Uh, it's similar to Google Analytics, just it's not from Google. Um, monitoring, uh, I really haven't didn't have I uh, had didn't have a need to look at it because the systems have been running smoothly but if necessary there is data dog and, and status cake and to check if uh, everything is uh, still up and running security also uh, putting in place the firewalls the certificates uh, patching all these things have to be taken into account or at, at one point your server may, may get uh, uh, into trouble and then also legal stuff like terms and conditions privacy policy and so on and finally Marketing. This is definitely not my my uh, piece of cake. So uh, 
uh, you may end up with a, a perfect site with, which has uh, a huge value, but if nobody knows it, yeah, it, it's not really useful either. So uh, yeah, bridging that that gap is uh, probably currently uh, the, the challenge that I'm I'm working with. Uh, so if somebody has uh, suggestions, uh, let me know. <laughs> Voila, that's it. I don't know if there is any more questions. Uh, otherwise. Yeah, I mean, we've got one, we've got one, but I um, guess uh, if, you, uh, if you've been watching and you like the, the talk, don't forget to like it on YouTube so that look, even more people can see, uh, can see Nick's talk who weren't able to join the, the live stream. So there's a, there's a little, some icons in the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, the question we've got is, uh, back to the visualization again now, so how much formatting of the data did you need to do to go from uh, what you get from Neo4j to what you pass to Cytoscape? Ah, yes. Well, in fact, um, yeah, I didn't mention it. Maybe uh, we should have talked a bit more about it. But um, so at one point, there is the Neo4j query that's, that's being run, and it also already returns um, like an, an a map, if I remember well. So I collect mm -hmm. the, the nodes and then the properties of these nodes. So it's already in a format that Cytoscape uh, requires. Um, yeah, I would have to think, but Cytoscape requires like an, a list of, of nodes and then a list of, of edges. And an edge is needs then to have an, a, a source ID and a target ID, some, something like that. I would have to look into the details, but that's exactly what uh, we're going to build uh, here. So the we have the, the nodes, now we have the, the relationships, and then we put that into a JSON. And that JSON is, uh, is actually sent back to the, to the front end. And that's exactly what's going to be used by, by Cytoscape. So that, that mapping is, is uh, fairly, fairly straightforward. You know. I had to look uh, to, to find the best way to, uh, to, uh, to solve this, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a common a problem and it's uh, it's well documented uh, on Stack Overflow as well. So yeah, cool. Yeah, I don't think that there haven't there aren't any more not any more questions in the last five minutes or so. So I'm going to assume there aren't uh, going to be any, and then I'm sure there'll be one just as uh, just as we uh, finish. But uh, thanks thanks Nick for taking the time to show us um, uh, to show us your stuff and open the box be if you want to go and play with that yourself. Um, and yeah, I guess uh, I guess we're done. So thanks everyone for joining, and again, thanks uh, thanks Nick for presenting. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you too. Cool. Bye everyone. Bye bye.